So thank you everyone and welcome to this session of the Brother Luke Psalm Workshop. My name is Marianne Donahue Lynch and I am the Associate Executive Director of the Office for Mission and Ministry for the District of Eastern North America. And it's wonderful to welcome back uh, so many of you again to this session and welcome to those of you that are new and joining us for the first time. It gives me a great pleasure to introduce our speaker this afternoon. Brother Robert Schaefer um, serves at the General Inn in Rome as part of the Secretariat for Lasallian Formation. And prior to his assignment in Rome, Brother Bob was the principal at Central Catholic in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And prior to that, he has served as a religion teacher, a campus minister, Lasallian youth moderator, and I'm sure many other hats he has worn throughout the years. So um, thank you so much for being with us this afternoon, Brother Bob, and welcome to the Brother Luke Psalm Workshop. Thanks, everyone. It's so great to see so many people here. First of all, I think we should pause and give a big shout out to these people from the Philippines. What is it, four o'clock in the morning? Lord, thank you for, a, I hope it's worked for a while to be up this early. And also to my friends in, in Lebanon, I see one of my favorite places I've come to know during my uh, time in the Secretariat. It's so great to see all of you. Uh, thank you for being part of this. So um, I'm going to start. I have a little PowerPoint to help move things along. And it's much better to look at that. Uh, and so I'll use this as we go along, hopefully, to just kind of help our discussion. But I, I just want to start by saying that I'm, I'm grateful to Mary Ann for this opportunity to be with you in this digital uh, Lasallian community that's uh, a group of people for the Luke Song Workshop that are directly engaged with uh, faith formation in its various forms. And I know in our district of Eastern North America, the Luke Song Workshop has become an important part of our the life of our district, it's where we work to ensure um, the vitality and dynamism of our efforts in religious education and faith formation. And, Especially for those of you that might remember Luke Psalm, it's, a, it's an honor to be part of a workshop that takes its name from such an important brother who did so much to help us understand our charism, our spirituality, uh, both from its origins and also its relevance today. And so it really is a, a great opportunity for me to be with you. You know, we never stray uh, from our North Star, which is our call to provide a human and Christian education to the students in our school communities. And so I very much appreciate the theme that Marianne has chosen for this year's virtual or digital workshop, accompaniment of youth in times of uncertainty. Because I think from our foundation, the, the operative framework of the Christian schools of Father de La Salle has always been one of accompaniment. And so just as we begin, I just invite us to pause for a moment and remember that all of us here from all over the world, that we pause as, our, as is our tradition. Let us
so Mary Ann calls this times of uncertainty. I think that's a polite term for chaos. We're in the midst of a global pandemic that's disrupted every aspect of our lives. In many parts of the world, we're engaging in a social upheaval as we reckon with the sin of racism or political corruption. There's political disorder on a national and international scale that really hasn't been seen for generations. For those of us engaged in, in Catholic education, the pending economic impact on our efforts at all levels, all of this could be sources of for confusion individually on their own, but taken together all at the same time, it's really created a sense of cultural chaos. Many of us are feeling a loss of order in our individual and perhaps institutional lives. And this can be psychologically and spiritually exhausting. Like the Psalmist and the prophets of the Old Testament, we can feel as if God has hidden his face from us. The psalmist in Psalm 30, I believe it is, cries out, Lord, when you hid your face, I was dismayed. I was thrown into confusion. But in the scriptures, the feeling that God has hidden his face gives way to the realization that God's compassionate action helps us see new life and new opportunities. The psalmist continues, you turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me in joy. Chaos, maybe, can be a blessing in disguise. I've been thinking recently of uh, De La Salle's image of the call of the Christian educator, right? So if you think of that image of the chaos before creation in the book of Genesis, before God speaks. John Baptist de how kind of picks up on that image in the first meditation for the time of retreat. And he says, just as he commanded light to shine out of darkness, so he kindles a light in the hearts of those destined to announce his word to children. So this chaotic and disruptive time can, if we allow it, provide us the freedom to imagine and create something new and life-giving in terms of our work in religious education and faith formation. That God's calming hand goes through the chaos and touches each one of us in a calming way to give us the confidence and the courage to spur kind of apostolic creativity of Lasallians around the globe. We've witnessed it during the course of this pandemic and this disruption. I'm thinking particularly of the young Lasallians and the many uh, creative ways they've worked during this time. You know, the, during the height of the lockdown in the spring, they had the Indivisa Manet program uh, through a, a virtual connection around the globe. And tomorrow marks the conclusion of the International Lasallian Days of Peace. And they're gonna pre prepare a concert to kind of close that session. Again, a great, sign of creativity to bring us together, to bring a sense of order and creativity, even though they seem like opposite terms during this time of upheaval. The spirit of creativity and innovation is especially needed in the area of faith formation. If we, if as we like to say, transforming the lives of the students is at the heart of Catholic education, We can't wait or be paralyzed by the present circumstances. The question becomes, I think, how can we facilitate a response to the call to transform the lives of our students toward discipleship with Jesus Christ? How do we plan and put into action experiences that move our students further along in their relationship with Jesus, with the church, and with their neighbor. A core identity marker of Lasallian Catholic education is that it's student-centered, always focused on addressing the needs of students. 
so that they can continue to grow into the person God intended them to be at the moment of their creation. We must, however, keep always in our mind that the arena of our endeavors is the school, the classroom, the campus or pastoral ministry center. Father uh, Gerald Arbuckle, who's a Catholic sociologist from Australia, observed that the purpose of Catholic educational ministry is ultimately not, not the evangelization of individuals. Rather, it's the building of faith communities in and through which individuals are supported and encouraged to grow as disciples of Jesus Christ. It's the community that creates the opportunity for students and teachers to grow as disciples of Jesus Christ. And I think that was the innovation of De La Salle and the First Brothers. They came to situate their efforts within the context of a community of learners, we would say today. As opposed to the chaotic and individual, individualized model that was in place in the charity schools at the time, the Christian schools were organized differently. The Christian schools were organized into a community with certain cultural practices. And soon they developed, as sociologists would say, a particular culture that marked them, that identified them. And it was in this kind of holistic or comprehensive environment that the work of human and Christian education began to take place. The community became the context, the recipient and the agent of the formation. We can see from our study of the foundation, the foundational history of our uh, community that the school was for De La Salle and the First Brothers, an intentional, what we would say today, maybe an intentional ecclesial community. It was a place where teachers and students would together encounter the person of Jesus Christ. And through this shared experience of teacher and student, commit themselves to live lives of charity, justice, mercy, and compassion. So all this is to say that while this might seem a chaotic and unsettling time, it's also a time of grace and a time of creative opportunity. This can be a comforting truth when we look at the complex challenges facing the future of the church, as well as many of our school communities. You're all familiar with the statistics and the research around the faith lives of young people. You'll be getting more of that tomorrow, I'm sure, or today was released earlier today from the Springtide Research Project. It's safe to say that from one perspective, things can appear pretty bleak. There is a gap between the religious experience of young people and the, and the starting point of many religious education curricula or ministry programs. As you go about your work each day, you might feel as if the gap is too wide to overcome. Sometimes we think that we spend a lot more time nowadays in the area of pre-evangelization. No, you don't have your video. Evangelization takes up more and more of our time and energy than it did in the past. In 2018, the Synod on Young People, Faith and Vocational Discernment tried, I think successfully, but tried to address this universal challenge that's facing the entire church. The Synod recognized that a substantial number of young people, this is a quote from the, the uh, preparatory document, it's a quote that really always causes me to really stop and reflect. It said, for a substantial number of young people, for all sorts of reasons, do not ask the church for anything because they do not see her as significant for their lives. I'm going to read that again. The Synod recognized that for a substantial number of young people, for all sorts of reasons, do not ask the church for anything 
because they do not see her as significant for their lives. Maybe it's something we could call a relevance gap. And where do we begin in order to bridge this gap? I think our failure or the church's failure or reality to acknowledge this reality that the church for many young people is totally irrelevant. The failure to acknowledge that I think contributes to the widening of the gap of irrelevance. And for us as LaSallian educators, if we don't try to bridge the gap, other cultural forces that are at odds with the gospel will continue to do so and continue to make great impacts in the lives of young people as they work to develop, as they work to develop their own worldview, their own sense of meaning. So we can become overwhelmed by the moment or Together, we can become creatively involved in trying to revision our faith formation efforts in the school. And I think this is where the call for action comes to the LaSallian community. Yeah. The call to action to bridge this gap. As we did at the beginning of our session, let's remember that we are in the holy presence of God. Am I, did something just come up on, can you hear me? Yes? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, because yes. it just said unmuted. So, okay, sorry. So we could become overwhelmed by the moment or we can together become creatively involved in trying to revision our faith formation efforts in the schools. As I said, we began with, let us remember we're in the holy presence of God. To me and to many, that's a powerful invocation. That's a powerful, like, that's the bugle blowing. That's a call to action. When we remember that we are in the holy presence of God, we, we can rise to the occasion. And so what I hope to do is to introduce today a framework for LaSallian formation that was developed by LaSallians from around the world. It was coordinated by the Secretariat for Formation in Rome. And this particular framework was developed, it was intended for people who are adults that are part of the LaSallian community, as well as young men beginning their lives as brothers uh, in their vocational journey, right? It was intended to, for, to help people deepen their understanding of and commitment to LaSallian ministry. It's a mission formation framework. However, it is a framework based on our pedagogy, spirituality, and history. So it's also a framework, I think, that can be applied to our efforts in the accompaniment and formation of the students who are entrusted to our care. But I think before we jump right into that framework, some context uh, would be helpful. Some context to put things into the particulars. I always think it, the, the final draft of this document was being written and, and finalized at the exact same time that the Synod on Young People, the Faith and Vocational Discernment was taking place in Rome in 2018. I think it's clear that such an overlap was the result of divine providence for a, a, a religious family, a charismatic family in the church dedicated uh, to the service of young people to be engaged in a reflection on formation during the same time that this synod was taking place uh, was no coincidence. The thinking and discussions of the synod, they were being shared during the time the writing team was together, either in the refectory, in the dining room, there were our brother superior, Bob Schiller was participating in the synod. There were other participants that were staying in the community. So certainly the energy and the interest in the synod was taking place at the same time. It was in the background, I'm sure, of our thinking and our reflecting. And this synod, the, the subsequent uh, response of Pope Francis, his apostolic exhortation is called Christus Vivit, Christ is Alive. And it's an important resource for anyone involved in religious education and faith formation. I really can't stress that enough, I think. 
Christus Vivut offers a powerful message to young people, no doubt, it's directed to young people, but it also speaks to those who are called to accompany them at the various stages of their lives. Many of the themes developed by the Holy Father in this uh, exhortation, I think resonate very much with the framework that I want to present. This time we're living in calls for creativity, as we've said, and we need to create opportunities that can strengthen young people in a life of faith, where they could be appropriately accompanied and inspired to encounter others and to engage in generous service to be a part of God's mission, to see themselves as part of God's mission. And Pope Francis has a great deal to say uh, in, in joy of the gospel, Evangelii Gaudium, he gets right to the point. My mission of being in the heart of the people is not just a part of my life or a badge I can take off, he says. It's not an extra or just another moment in life. Instead, my mission is something I cannot uproot from my being without destroying my very self. I am a mission on this earth. That is the reason why I am here in this world. That's the same for each one of us gathered here this afternoon or this morning or this evening, wherever you find yourself. And it's very much this case for each one of our students that they are a mission. They are not here by accident. Mission is at the center of all that we're talking about. And since the Second Vatican Council, there's been a shift in our understanding of mission and our understanding of the church in relation to mission. Mission is understood as an attribute of God. We have to come to understand that understand God as mission, the life of the Trinity, the dynamic interplay of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that is mission. It's one of sending out life, of creation, and it's also the call to reconciliation, of bringing the world together. And so I frequently play this next clip to help explain what we mean by saying that God is a mission. I don't think you can get a better teacher than... Una vez un chico me preguntó Once a child asked me Ustedes saben que los chicos preguntan cosas difíciles You know that kids ask difficult questions Me preguntó They asked me Padre, father ¿Qué hacía Dios antes de crear el mundo? What did God do before creating the world? Les aseguro, I assure you, que me costó contestar. I found real difficulty to answer the question. Y le dije lo que les digo ahora a ustedes. So I said what I'm now going to say to you. Antes de crear el mundo, before creating the world, Dios amaba. God loved. Porque Dios es amor. Because God is love. Pero era tal el amor que tenía en sí mismo. And so much love. Ese amor entre el Padre y el Hijo en el Espíritu Santo. Spirit, era tan grande, tan desbordante. It was so overflowing. Que... Esto no, no sé si es muy teológico, pero lo van a entender. I don't know if this is very logical, era, but you'll understand. Era tan grande que no podía ser egoísta. He was so big, it was so big this love, that God could not be egoistic. Tenía que salir de sí mismo. It had to be poured out of him. Para tener a quien amar fuera de sí. So as to share that love with those out of himself. Y ahí Dios creó el mundo. And then God created the world. Situate mission with God. Mission is at the center, but it's God's mission. And for some reason, 
God created the world in such a way that he needs our cooperation to make the world more like he intended it to be. And so for, for us Christians, we understand that in the fullness of time, he sends Jesus to show us God's mission. To both point it out when it's visible and also to teach us, to show us what it entails. The Gospels are all about this mission-focused activity of Jesus. And Jesus, he has a name for this mission, this mission of God. He calls it the reign of God. And that's what he came to show us, to came to teach us, came to live it. He is the living embodiment of the mission of the reign of God. And so during his time on earth, Jesus is continuously forming a group of people to come to know this mission, to come to understand this mission, to come to live into this mission by knowing him, by spending time with him, by understanding this mission and all its implications as they walk along and journey with Jesus. And he does this because when his physical presence comes to an end, they can remain united with him and they can continue to point out, to teach, and to show what the mission is, what the reign of God is. But that's not the end. God sends the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, throughout the whole world, right? He says, I'm not going to leave you orphans. I'm sending my Spirit among you. And he sends the Spirit among the entire world, beyond these group of followers of Jesus that were there, but to the whole world inspiring people with this understanding of mission, of transforming the world more the way God intended it to be. God's mission is for the whole world, for everyone. It's not a church-centered mission. Rather, it's a mission-centered church. Mission is what God does in and through the church and the world. In other words, it's a phrase we've come to say frequently that it's not so much that God's church has a mission, it's that God's mission has a church, that God's mission has each one of us. God's mission has the Lasallian community. And I think it's that missionary impulse that impels us outward, that moves us to bring the merciful face of God to the whole world, to be, as Pope Francis suggests, a field hospital. And such an understanding of mission, this broad sense of mission for the whole world, of orienting it in God's design and, God, and our very understanding of God's nature, helps us see the important role of Catholic education, that God's mission really depends on schools like the ones we have. School communities are not sanctuaries set apart from the turmoil and difficulties of life. Schools become the place where young people experience the reign of God through people like yourselves. They experience the merciful face of God. They experience what it means to be loved and accepted. They experience what it means to be corrected and challenged. And so it's an experience of the reign of God, but it is also at the same time a training ground for missionaries to go forward and bring about the reign of God. It doesn't just rest with an ex a, a nice feeling that the true mission is always pushing us outward, pushing us to the margins, pushing us to go beyond where we thought we could go. It's to help us bring about the reign of God. And so when we talk about a Lasallian framework for formation or for religious education, it's always centered around that idea of mission. That God so loved the world that he wants to transform the world and he wants to show us how to do it. The gospel, the incarnation shows us and gives us the strength to do that. And so with this understanding of mission, chapter seven of that exhortation, Christus Vivit, makes much more sense. So if you read nothing else, you don't want to read the whole uh, document. It's not that long. But if you don't want to read the whole thing, I encourage you to focus on chapter seven. And at one point, the Holy Father makes a very definitive statement that's worth our reflection this afternoon. He says, for religion teachers, I think this is important. And maybe some of the people with whom we work or who tell us what we have to do should listen as well. But he says very directly, 
rather than being too concerned with communicating a great deal of doctrine, let us try to awaken and consolidate the great experiences that sustain the Christian life. Rather than being too concerned with communicating a great deal of doctrine, let us try to awaken and consolidate the great experiences that sustain the Christian life. The Pope's understanding of faith formation doesn't put much emphasis on these labels, whether conservative or liberal or traditional or progressive, he says. What's important is that we make use of everything that has borne good fruit and that we try to effectively communicate the joy of the gospel. We must renew our efforts with young people to share the kerygma, the proclamation of God's love in Jesus in a way that lands in the hearts of young people so as to help them to come, up, to come to bring about the reign of God in their own lives, in their homes, in their neighborhoods, in the career choices they make. The love of God and our relationship with the living Christ does not hold us back from dreaming, the Pope writes. They do not requ require us to narrow our horizons. As Paul VI says, in the very discontent that you feel, a ray of light is present. Restless discontent combined with exhilaration before the opening up of new horizons generates a boldness that leads you to stand up and take responsibility for the mission. And that's what we want to try to do. And then in this document, uh, we get pure Francis, I think. We get the real Jorge Mario Bergoglio, right? The former high school teacher, the pastor, the youth minister, because he makes these very creative direct appeal to the young people. And he uses very vivid imagery. He says, dear young people, make the most of these years of your youth. Don't observe life from the balcony. Don't confuse happiness with an armchair or live behind a screen. Whatever you do, do not become the sorry sight of an abandoned vehicle. Don't be parked cars, but dream freely. Make good decisions, take risks, even if it means making mistakes. Don't go through life anesthetized or approach the world like tourists. Instead, make a ruckus. Now, I don't know about you, but make a ruckus could, my former life as a Dean of Students, that gets a little nerve wracking, but make a ruckus, he says. Cast out the fears that paralyze you so that you don't become young mummies. Live, give yourself over to the best of life. Open the doors of the cage, go out and fly. Please, he says, do not take an early retirement. And so, it's with this kind of understanding of mission, of the challenge that the, uh, the church is teaching us through the, the, the writing of the Holy Father, it's with this understanding of mission in mind that I think now we can turn our attention to the framework developed in LaSalle Information for Mission, the Pilgrim's Handbook. And I know there's certain parts of the uh, Institute that are familiar with this document already very much, I've seen the work that's been done, particularly in the Philippines is incredible. We could all learn a great deal. So hopefully these little reflections now are, are helpful, but if it makes sense, I encourage those of you that are participating to really make a journey on the internet and see some of the, the work that's being done by the various campus ministry departments uh, in the Philippines. It's really, really great work. So I, I hope I can contribute a little bit, but I know that that group has done an excellent job. And so the first transition to keep in mind is that this framework is for a broad audience. And I'm not sure, at least in the United States, I'll say this, I'm not sure if we see our work in the religion class, classroom or in, in pastoral ministry or campus ministry, I don't think we've ever referred to that as formation, right? 
we don't often do that. Formation is something that happens with the adults. But the use of the word does provoke, I think, a broader understanding of what we're doing in our schools, right? And it can situate our efforts as religion teachers or campus ministers within the overall project of the school as a whole, and even within the life of the district. We said at the beginning of the session that LaSallian education seeks to transform lives. Formation, transformation. Transformation is really the goal of formation. It's important to keep in mind, I think, that the meaning of transform is the same as transfigure. Both originate from the same Greek word. And they mean changing a being from within. It's an internal development, an internal change, as opposed to external. And so our efforts are focused on helping our young people develop the values and virtues of the gospel. And this framework of formation for mission for our youth is intended to be an antidote to the concept of, uh, well, what's the, what they'll reveal in the springtide research, the distance that young people feel from the church. Also some of the, the uh, research that's been done over the years, kind of that where they talk about the moralistic therapeutic deism, right? Where God is a distant reality who's not really important in my life, except if I need something, I can kind of call upon him like a, a divine Santa Claus. Rather, I think by engaging young people, we want to challenge them to have an encounter with Jesus Christ in the events of their lives. We want to challenge them to have an experience of Jesus Christ, especially with people who are poor and on the margins, as well as through, of course, through the sacraments, the Eucharist. We want them to try to live a life with Jesus fully alive, that as they continue at this stage of their lives to develop their worldview, to develop their understanding and to search for meaning, that they look to those messages of the gospel to do so. Now we're living in challenging times and of course every generation can say that probably. Um, the values and practices kind of at play right now in what we call the postmodern era, they present a unique set of challenges, especially with regards to uh, identity and formation, especially with regards to people that work in faith formation. And one image used to describe the postmodernist is that of a vagabond or a tourist. And the idea, what keeps a vagabond moving is his disillusionment with the last place of rest and the hope that eventually the right locale will be found to give them a long awaited sense of meaning. He's just kind of itinerant, wandering around, a vagabond without roots or destination, kind of a nomad without any kind of itinerary or direction. Many young people live like tourists. Right? They live without any commitment to or any in-depth social or spiritual encounters with the people they see while they travel along. And it can be a dehumanizing experience. But for us, the metaphor that we chose to use in the development of the framework is that of pilgrimage. Now, it was a bit of a debate back and forth because in Spanish and in French, there is a word that really works well. It needs no explanation. It, people that speak the language and understand it know what it means. It's itinerario or itinerare, but that doesn't translate so well into English. And so we consciously chose the word pilgrimage. Pilgrimage is understood as a, a personal and communal journey of faith that deepens a sense of mission with individuals and a community. A pilgrimage takes time. It involves pauses along the way that provide opportunities for insight, and renew the pilgrim's motivation to continue. A pilgrimage is not always easy or smooth. It includes detours and interruptions, suffering and in inconvenience. And those times are key opportunities for growth. And it's in this understanding of pilgrimage and the guiding metaphor for the formation framework where I think you can see connections with the visions of youth ministry developed in Christus Vivit make a rocket. It's not smooth. And what makes a pilgrimage significant are those times along the journey that invite the pilgrim to stop, 
to contemplate and be transformed by what is seen and experienced. And so we call these pauses, these opportunities for integration and growth, we call them threshold experiences, right? It's that liminal time where you pause before you begin the next step. I've recently discovered uh, a really interesting area of learning science, of pedagogical research that might help us understand how this idea of the threshold experience can relate to our work in schools. None of, I swear to you, none of us on the writing team were familiar with this area of research during our own discussions and development of the handbook. It's called the threshold concept, believe it or not. And it's a model for disciplinary learning at the level of higher education. And it describes the process by which students enter into a particular discipline or field of study. The key for the researchers in this area is adopting threshold concepts that trouble or provoke previously held ways of looking at a specific concept or a specific area of the discipline. Threshold concepts force students of a particular field to see things differently, differently than they once had. And they have, they have to understand that it's difficult, if not impossible, once they've had this threshold concept, it's impossible to go back. It's impossible to see things the same way as you did before. It's that time of liminal space between being a novice and moving toward being an expert. And it's one of these theories that they try to use with university teachers to improve the teaching. But really, that is the idea that we had in mind with the image of the thresholds. And to introduce the key element of the framework, I share this picture with you. It's a, it's a modern sculpture from 2012. And it's a painted and patinated bronze door by the British contemporary artist, Gavin Turk. I think it's interesting. It's removed from any room, house, or building. And with its paint seemingly peeling away, it appears to have been left to the elements of nature for some years. The fact that it's made from bronze gives it a permanent quality though. So the doors can't be destroyed by rain or adverse weather. It looks to be fragile with its paint flaking away, but as it's made from bronze, it's solid and permanent. It's in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus tells us, knock and the door will be open to you. He knew the symbolism that doors hold. Doors open and doors close, depending on which side you look at the door. It's both an entrance and an exit, but doors are first and foremost an entrance. And in our Lasallian tradition, the doorway is very much a powerful image, right? We recall that it was at the doorway of the convent in March of 1679, that eventually a door was opened for De La Salle. Think about De La Salle and that doorway experience. Doors usually lead to the inside of something. They symbolize transition and passageway from one place to another. Doors, in that sense, hold an element of mystery. They separate two distinct areas, keeping things apart. And so for, for us, we know the space we're in, but not yet the space that lies beyond the door. And the mysterious beyond is hidden from sight by the closed door. And so some sort of action has to be taken so that the other side becomes visible and available to us. And it becomes a matter of choice a decision whether we want to walk through that door. The, joy, the choice to stay or to go of stepping into a new world. Jesus uses that image of door in the context of his disciples asking him how to pray. And he tells us to not put a do not disturb sign on our door handle, right? We have to keep knocking on the door, asking, searching, so that God can open the door in his own time through our daily experiences, our relationships, and our being accompanied. So the door is loaded with hope of a new life, new opportunities, new horizons. We leave the now behind to a better next. And so in the formation framework, these thresholds, these moments of moving towards a deeper encounter are experiences that open up a new invitation to deepen our understanding of and commitment to God's mission. So we've identified five 
key threshold or liminal moments of deeper commitment, right? Induction from outside to inside. Maybe if we think about our students, it's understanding what, it, what being part of a, a Lasallian Christian community means, right? Making that initial commitment to be part of the school community. Belonging from me to we. It's kind of that time where there's a convergence between personal beliefs and values and the values and beliefs of the faith community. Commitment from career, from this, in the handbook, we call it from career to calling, but really for students, it would be something different from this idea that I'm beginning to understand that maybe my life has a deeper purpose, seeing my life as a mission. My life is not coincidental. God has a plan for me in the world and I need to discover that. This idea of Lasallian uh, community that fosters vocation. And then the next is co-responsibility. And this is where we can help students as they move along to kind of have a sense of responsibility, to take direction, to help with the mission. Maybe it's through peer ministry or leading retreats or coordinating service projects or giving a reflection. I think some of the reflections that have been shared on our website of students offering the gospel reflection have been great examples of co-responsibility. And then finally, wisdom. Well, I don't know how much wisdom a young person can share, but certainly a senior can share some wisdom with a, a first year student. But those kinds of opportunities to give students to deepen and to share their faith. And as we think about this idea of the thresholds as we go along, we can see this in the life of De La Salle as he traveled, as we were familiar with that story, right? Choosing to be brothers, right? Belonging from me to we. The vow, the heroic vow and the vow of association that the brothers made. And so those are the ideas that, the, the thresholds that are there, the opportunities that we can find in the life of the school or in the life of a student's time with us to deepen and provoke them to go further, to be conscious about how we do that. And so uh, what we try to do then is to identify uh, on this formative pilgrimage, what is it that's distinctively Lasallian, right? Th this global reflection that we did to prepare the document helped us to identify what we thought were five domains or five capacities that would really be the marker of someone from the Lasallian tradition the distinctiveness of our own family, our charism. But these domains might need a, a bit of reflection in terms of religious education and formation for students, right? We have lots more that we need to, to make sure we expose the students to as they develop their, their worldview. But let me just share with you that one of them is that we help our, all the Salians come to see with the eyes of faith, that to develop the ability to pray and to have certain spiritual practices that keep them grounded, that keep them in touch with this idea of the reign of God. In the book, in the framework, we use the expression growth and freedom, but really what we mean is the skill of discernment. How do we enable and empower our students with the ability to make good decisions, to make a reflection on what a good decision are, is? This idea of being part of a community, right? A non-hierarchical community. Uh, we talk about the brotherhood and sisterhood that we want our students to experience in the school. And then finally, this idea of solidarity and care for the world through education. Really, for young people, I think it would be awakening in them a solidarity with those who are on the margins, those who are poor, those who are in need. And so let me just bring this to a conclusion. We have proposed a framework that tries to support the direction and vision proposed in the apostolic exhortation from the Pope in the aftermath of the Synod and in the tradition of our Lasallian commitment to transform lives. I think it needs further reflection and development as we try to uh, put it into practice in our schools and in our uh, religious education and faith formation uh, programs. But people like yourselves, practitioners like yourselves are the ones that I think will help move this along and make it become much more effective and meaningful. Crossing the threshold to activate the personal charism of our students for the reign of God. Each of them has a gift, 
each of them has a charism, how can we begin to activate that uh, and move that along during their journey? And so let me stop there and just uh, thank you for listening and considering. I know with a large group like this, it's hard to, to um, do any kind of interaction, but I'll just ask you if you have any observations you want to put in the chat, I'm going to unshare my thing. That you're most welcome to offer those observations. Well, thank you, Brother Bob. As people are having the opportunity to offer a reflection or a question or insight in the chat, um, let me just take this time to thank you for your presence uh, here with us um, this afternoon. And again, a reminder to us that in the midst of, yes, this chaos, uh, God's calming hand uh, does provide for us this opportunity to be creative um, with each other and, you know, within our Lasallian family and across the Institute. Um, the need for the continued development of intentional faith communities, particularly for our students, but for all Lasallians as well, you know, is something that we continue on our journey. And as we step through those new doors, those thresholds that we encounter, uh, in the words of Pope Francis, may we all embrace no matter our age, um, the joy of the gospel, recognizing that we are a mission and that we're called to dream freely in that imaginatory and imagination uh, experience with Trinity and to cause a ruckus and to look you know, at the needs of our society because uh, we're all young at heart. We all need to, um, as Lasallians, respond to the realities that are placed uh, in front of us in our time in our cultural context, in our communal context. So thank you um, so much for your insights. And um, let's see if there's anything in particular as I go through the chat. Let me make sure that, um, or if you see something there, uh, Brother Bob. No, I just say, say again that it's been a great um, opportunity to be with you and to just to share what uh, this framework has the possibility to do. Hopefully, as we continue to reflect in these times when we, I, I'm, I'm interested to see the research that was released today um, about the state of religion and young people, because I think, again, it will give us more to reflect on in terms of, of how we respond. But I think the framework is broad enough to help us in our tradition to do that. So thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, no, thank you. And absolutely, thank you for bringing up um, about the research that came out from uh, Springtide Institute today on the state of religion and young people in 2020. I did have the opportunity to listen to the presentation on Facebook Live that Dr. Josh Packard uh, provided as an overview uh, as they released the findings of that study. And um, in relationship to what you just provided to us, in terms of the Pilgrim's Handbook and the opportunity for the use of that handbook in relationship to uh, the Springtide um, resources and their findings um, from their study uh, it is excellent. So for us as Lasallians, again, uh, Divine Providence brings things together uh, in a very timely fashion for us. And just a reminder that Dr. Josh Packard will be our presenter uh, tomorrow evening, beginning at 7 p.m. Eastern time as uh, part of the Brother Luke Psalm workshop. So um, again, your presentation and what we'll be hearing from Dr. Packard tomorrow uh, will really help us in our continued ministry with and for the young people entrusted to our care. So we do have, um, we have a minute or two here. We do have some reflections in the chat. Um, just read through them perhaps. So from brother Tim Caldwell, you mentioned that faith formation is for the community, yet we seem to default to measuring through surveys and studies the individual. Are you aware of studies that evaluate and assess how young people experience their faith in a community? Um, if not, what are your perspectives? 
I don't know of any research that does that. That's a good question. It might be, if anybody's looking for a doctoral study, that could be a good one. <laughs> but uh, I do think my experience tells me that um, the way that it works is that really our schools created environment where it's not just, in fact, many times it's anything but the religion classroom where they get a sense of their purpose, where they get a sense of uh, encounter. So how can we make those, make that sense of our school culture more intentional? would be kind of what I've been reflecting on. You know, when uh, uh, not just the, to burden the campus ministry or the religion department, but how does it spread out all over the place? You know, the way that the different activities are developed, the different cultural components of a school are factored in to help make it an environment that leads people to this encounter uh, and to a deepening of faith. So it is a challenge and I think it depends on the, the situation, but it it's the idea of trying to open things out to be, that whole idea of the whole school community working together. Uh, thank you, brother. I'm from brother Ernest Miller from LaSalle University. In what way should the framework lead us to reimagine how we do religious education in our schools? That, that's, a, that's a great question because that's something that I've been reflecting on myself in terms of what does it mean? And I, I keep coming back to this idea of uh, when we did the, the framework for mission formation, right, for the, the formation of LaSalle, brothers and Lasallians uh, in the charism, it was really a call to move away from this idea of formation as discrete program. You know, that you go to a certain program and it's just one program after another and to orient the whole process within this experiential journey. So the same thing would be true rather than, uh, and I know because of the way schools are set up, you have to have certain uh, courses and certain levels there, but is there a way to rethink it that it's much more experiential, much more an opportunity of immersion and reflection in different areas or ways to go forward? And, and what would that look like? So for me, that's kind of the, the point of departure. What is it that we can do to make our um, religious formation programs really experiential and provocative for the students? And that's where I think the creativity of the group will come in. Thank you, and I have one more question. There are several um, comments in the chat, so I would ask people to please read through those comments, but um, one final question um, from our friend Adio in the Philippines. How do you foster a sense of community in your social context amid the racism and other social divides on campuses? Can you cite any concrete examples and or experiences? So that would be beyond my uh, reach there, having now been uh, a prisoner in the gilded cage in Rome. So I haven't been on a campus for a while to witness that. I've kind of witnessed from afar. So I would, you know, there's others that can certainly speak to that better than I can. Um, Brother Ernest Miller, could I ask you to unmute yourself perhaps from LaSalle University and give a perspective um, briefly on the experience of dealing uh, with this issue of racism on the campus. Well, not on the campus, but within the, the context of campus. Or do I need to unmute you? Oh, no, you're unmuted. I'm trying to grasp, uh, I, I think I understand the question, but I'm trying to a short way try to ascertain how to respond to the question. Um, I, I think some of the things that came up in the Yalu dialogue, live stream dialogue a few weeks ago um, as it regards, you know, our educational settings and perhaps the first interests um, in terms of what I'm going to say is on a higher education level that I don't think it should be siloed to higher education is a question came from one of the participants in Singapore. Uh, LaSallian educated he is, finished a PhD in, uh, at Boston College recently about how do we decolonize our curriculum, right? So that is a growing conversation in education, particularly higher education. In other words, um, you know, to what extent is our curriculum across the board um, reflective of a Western, a European, a white um, perspective, right? That, that's the general. So, that, so that's one issue, um, I think, 
um, one can discern and see how do you uh, go about enacting uh, a decolonizing of the curriculum. And another issue, um, Brian Massengale, a priest at Fordham University here in the US re recently wrote about is regarding our liturgical and other religious images, right? The images that we constantly see of Jesus as, uh, as if he's Swedish, right? All of that um, speaks to us of the things that we must wrestle with. Um, and then finally, I would say that we got to wrestle with um, the, uh, the, the racism that is within our systems as a trauma therapist based in Minneapolis talks about. He, he talks about white body supremacy and all of us of all colors are infected with this virus including this dark-hued brother. And so he's arguing um, that we all need to wrestle with it because it's within us, right? And so we can't keep looking out. We need to look within. So let me just stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Ernest. Um, I appreciate that response to the question of our colleague from the Philippines. So I will like to end with a reflection that uh, one of our colleagues placed into the chat and it's, um, thank you, Brother Bob. This document will help us to have a clearer direction in terms of ministering to our youth. May St. LaSalle accompany us all in our LaSallean journey. Thank you, everyone. Um, I sent uh, an email to those of you that are registered for the Brother Luke Psalm workshop that has information regarding the Spring Tide Institute study that was released today so that you could perhaps look that over before our conversation with brother, with brother, with Dr. Uh, Josh Packard tomorrow. But Brother Bob, thank you so much. It's been a wonderful uh, hour plus um, being with you. And uh, thank you for the talk, both practical and inspiring. Live Jesus in our hearts. Forever. Forever. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening, a good day, a good afternoon, a good night. Thank you, Bob.